And nothing gets me amped up like seeing a guy just get destroyed, right? <laughs> like, I don't know. Some, maybe it's something about me. I don't know. And I, I, it's been a few weeks. That's not written into this. That's not, we haven't even started the message yet. Uh, it's been a few weeks since you've seen your friend. In fact, it's been a month, uh, and you've been texting, you've been reaching out, and you're just like, man, like they're not responding. And so I, I, I love them, I care about them, I want them to win, and so we're going to go ahead, and, and you're going to check on them, right? And so I, I go over there, and I, I knock on the door, and there's kind of just like a rustling and some grumbling in the background, but you know somebody's there, and there's a shuffling, and eventually they get to the door, and they open it, and you see him, and he is, y'all, he is frail, Skin and bone, like eyes sunken into the back of his head. Like clearly he's not well. Clearly he's sick. Like it's not a time for pleasantries. And so you just kind of put that to the side. Say, hey, what happened? Like I saw you a month ago and you were fine. Like what is going on? Clearly something is up. What can I do to help you? And your friend responds. They say, hey, honestly, I'm just so hungry. I haven't eaten in a month. So you blitz by him, right, because you, you love him and you care about him, and so you run into the room and you go to the fridge and you open the door, and it's got everything. Like, it's, it's completely full. Like, there's the meats and the cheeses and bread, and, and there's drinks, and there's all the different pieces that you could possibly want. And so you're just like, hey, what is it? Like, what's going on? Like, buddy, I love you, but this fridge is full. Like, why haven't you eaten for a month? He says, well, yeah, I, I, I've got the food, but until you came, I haven't had anyone here to feed me, so I'm starving. Now, like, I know that that's extreme, unless, unless you're me. Like, if Jenny ever goes on vacation, check on me, because me and the kids, we're, <laughs> we're starving to death. <laughs> like, I know it's extreme, but at the same point, this is often our approach to church world, Right? Like where we've got this, this mindset that, hey, you know what, church is going to be the only place where I get the spiritual nourishment that I need. And we expect it to possibly sustain us throughout the week. And we start viewing church as this three-course meal, like does it have the kids' ministry and the worship and the strong message. And y'all, like I'm not minimizing that. Like I hope that we have those things. We believe that we're meant to do those things well. And at the same time, that's not enough to carry you through the week. What does it look like for us to take so seriously, to, to recognize that, that once a week is not enough, the fridge is full, it's time to feed yourself? Like the fridge, like we got to go to the fridge and figure out what does it look like for me to get that, that source of nutrition because so quickly we become these spiritually malnourished Christians who don't have the strength to be able to stand in the game even if our number was called. What would it look like for us to be the disciples that Jesus has called us to be? And oftentimes what that looks like, really out of the gate, because last week we talked about what it means to get in the huddle, and this week we're not even talking about what it means to be in the game or be a disciple maker, because before you can be a disciple maker, we first need to be a disciple. What does it look like for us to be spiritually nourished, strengthened, and matured so that we can do it with others? If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open up to John uh, chapter 10. As you get there, we're going to be bouncing between John 10 and John 15. So there's going to be a little bit of, of movement in this message, but that's all right. As you get there, I'm Josh. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here at 180 Life Church, and we are in a series called Get in the Game. Right? It's a series about how like, we're not meant to just be these spectators, even though there's like, I don't know if you've experienced, but there's just kind of a gravity to spectating. Like Sometimes we just want to kind of step back and watch and observe and see what's going on. But so often Jesus says, hey, I want you out of the stands, I want you onto the field, and I want you to get in the game. But before we do that, like, we're going to get wrecked like that dude on the screen, right? Like, because if we're not spiritually nourished, if we're not prepared, if we're not armored up, trained up, prayed up, if we don't have the spiritual muscles, we're not going to make a spiritual impact. John 10 starts to talk about this in verse 2. It says, uh, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. It's Jesus. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. We're going to continue to verse 4. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because he promises them good things. No, wait, that's not it. Hold on. Because of all the money, 
No, that's not it. Like, because it's going to be easy? No, no, no. It's because they, what is it? They know his voice. That's it. And, we, like, that's so important for us because we need to, like, like, even just think about some of the people whose voices you know. That's not automatic, right? Like, it's not like just one day you're like, mm, I automatically, like, I've never met you before, but I know your voice. Right? There's relationship there. And it's a mutual relationship because the sheep, they know his voice, and Jesus calls them by Name. There's a mutual relationship where they know each other. See, uh, I want you to think about somebody whose voice you know. It's probably somebody that you've listened to, not talked to, listened to a whole lot. And the question, like, do we know Jesus well enough that you and I, that we can identify his voice? And even more importantly, sometimes, not always, identify the counterfeits that come into our lives. Because it says in this, this verse, even just a couple verses later, it says, hey, if the sheep hear a stranger's voice, what do they do? They flee. They're out of there. They're like, hey, listen, you're a counterfeit. You're not the real thing. Bio con Dios. I got somewhere else to go. And we need to be a people that are so caught up in his voice, so, so at his feet that we've listened to him so often that we can know his voice clearly. They say that uh, babies, when they're born, that they already know mom and dad's voice. That's not an accident. It's not like, like their DNA. They're like, mama? Like, it's not like their genetics like, tells them who your, their parents are. That's not how it works. It's because as soon as they have antennas growing out of the side of their head, they're hearing some voices. By the time they're born, they've been listening to mom and dad for months. Do we listen to God enough that we would know his voice. You might say, hey, Josh, what does this have to do with a full fridge? Like, why, uh, why are we talking about God's voice? Well, it's really clear in Scripture, actually. It's mentioned in Deuteronomy 8 and also in Matthew 4, where it's like, hey, like, man is not supposed to survive on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. God's word is our food. Like, if you want spiritual nourishment, it's not just coming to me and, like, having a conversation. Uh, I mean, that's good. Like, Biblical conversations are really important, but we need to get to the fridge ourselves. It's not just about coming to church on Sundays. It's about getting the feeding that we need so that we've got the muscles, that when he calls our number and we step onto the field, we're the ones making the place. We need to know his voice. See, I want to change the story on the front end a little bit because I think this is more applicable to us. Most of us aren't just starving throughout the month. What we do is we've got a different regimen that we take part in. I want you to imagine that I came to you and I said, hey, I have a new plan for my life and I'm going to get shredded. Here's what I'm going to do. On Sunday mornings, I'm going to eat everything. Like I'm talking buffet style. Like I'm going to get everything I can. I'm just going to cram it into that morning. It's going to be so incredible. I'm always going to look forward to Sunday. Sunday is good. Uh, now the rest of the week, I'm going to fast. It's not a good strategy, right? You're going to be like, hey, Josh, you are going to wither away. Like even like if you're talking about building muscle, working out once a week is not enough, right? You need consistency. You need to be doing it on a regular basis. Why? Because in order to build muscle, in order to build strength, or to, in this case, get nutrition, it needs to happen more than once a week. We can't be a people that just show up on Sundays, say we did our part, eat the meal, and then don't eat for the rest of the week. See, this, uh, this idea of knowing his voice implies trust, right? Like there's this, there's this implication here where they know Jesus' voice. They're eating his food. They know who he is. Uh, and there's this ability at that point to follow. And that implies some trust. Why? Because I have some voices that I know. And I'm not going where you're going. Right? Like, like, there's just some people who are like, whether it be, be foolish or whatever, uh, there's just some reasons why, like, hey, like the way that you are leading right now, that's not a direction that I want to go to. And yet these sheep, they hear his voice and they do something different. The sheep hear his voice and they follow. And that's built on trust. And trust, in turn, is built on time. Think about it. Who do you trust the most? Someone that you've spent the most time with, probably. Right? Like, it's the people that you are actively at their feet. Like, if there's a person in your life, you're like, hey, this is the person I trust the most. I hope it's your spouse, but maybe, we'll see what happens. Uh, it's someone that you have been spending 
time with. Don't nudge each other. It's not time. It's not time. It's somebody that you've been spending a ton of time with, and yet, who are we supposed to trust the most? It's God. And so often, he is the one we spend the least time with. See, in order for us to follow Jesus actively in in the way that the gospel calls us to, it's going to require us to risk in tremendous ways. And it's going to cost us a lot. And you're not going to do it. I'm not going to do it unless I'm this close to him. Jesus adjacent is not enough. We need to be right up next to each other. We need to be so close that it is easy to hear a whisper. We need to be so close that following is not, not even something we think about. It's an automatic response because our trust in him is so big. We would follow automatically. And here's what I want to do. I want to step away from this story for a second because uh, we're talking about what it means to be a disciple. But if you go to any church, uh, I don't know, anywhere, uh, and you say, hey, do you believe in discipleship? Every church is going to say yes. And then you might say, hey, so what does that mean to you? And some churches have a definition. It's probably going to be different than other churches, and that's okay. Uh, But most churches are going to say, we don't have a definition. And we need to have some alignment and some unity. Uh, I want to create that just really right out of the gate in the middle of this transition because we need to have some common language as we move forward. So let's go ahead. We're going to define a disciple. We're going to get our definition because it needs to be biblical. It's going to be from Matthew 4.19. Uh, It's where Jesus calls his first disciples and he says, hey, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so here's what we know. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus. He says, follow me. Someone who is Changed by Jesus, I will make you fishers of men. Someone who is committed to the mission of Jesus. And I would challenge us just as a congregation, I want you to try to memorize that. I'm going to say it about a billion times over the next infinity, so that's okay. I'll keep bringing it up. Uh, But we need to remember this because we have a responsibility to be disciples. And if we want to be it, we need to know what it is. And it's someone who is following Jesus, but not just for the sake of following. It's following for transformation. That's what a disciple does. They get transformed for the mission of Jesus. That means making disciples ourselves. We talked about it last week, that we're meant to be corner carriers of the map, right? Like we're supposed to pick up a corner and bring other people who are sick. I was even reading in Mark this week about how they, they, they heard about Jesus, they gathered together, and they would just take the sick, they'd carry them on mats. This isn't just a one-off story that we shared last week. It was a process that people were invited into as they carried out the mission of Jesus. We are meant to be fishers of men. So I'll say it one more time just so we're all clear. A disciple is someone who is following Jesus, changed by Jesus, and on mission with Jesus. And here's the thing. If we are not getting the spiritual nourishment we need, we're not being changed in the way we're meant to be changed. And here's the problem with that. I want to take the same scenario as before. You show up to your friend's house. They are spiritually, physically, they are malnourished. Does it make a difference to you that they've got on a Globo Gym t-shirt? Like, does it, does it make a difference that they're like, hey, I've got a personal trainer, and they've been showing up every week for me? Does it, does it matter what their meal plan was? If they're not doing it, they're not eating. Like we need to, like there, there's just a, a recognition that we need to have that we need to be changed by Jesus. And the only way that happens is if we're following him and we're following him closely. And here's why it's important. The best thing that you can do for your family, for your job, for your community, for your kids, is have a close abiding relationship with Jesus. That is the best thing you can do. And that's not just to say, hey, we're meant to be these spiritual hermits who just sit in a cave and we read the word all the time. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is as we dive into the word, that as he grows some spiritual muscles in us, we're gonna start flexing those muscles. And it's gonna lead out to transformation in our lives that transcends not just through us, but into our families, into our communities, into our state, into our nation. We become a people who are making disciples of all nations. But that only happens if we are getting the nourishment we need. The fridge is full, y'all. But you have to feed yourself. John 15, 1, Jesus kind of brings it home in a different way. He says this. He says, I am the 
true vine. There are fake vines out there, but he's like, hey, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. I love this right out of the gate. Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to let you know the roles that exist in this story. He says, hey, I'm the true vine. You want life? You need to be connected to me. The only way to, to have the sustenance, the nourishment that you need to grow and mature, he's like, hey, I'm the vine. You need to be connected. Guess what? You are, and he says it later on in the chapter, you're the branches. Like you and I, we have to be connected to the vine to have the life that we were designed to have. And The father, he's the gardener. And when we're talking about the guy who's putting it all together and setting us up to grow and mature, getting the soil the right way, making sure things are happening in alignment with his will, he's like, hey, the gardener's got this covered. The father is here, and he's here to help us bear fruit. And this phrasing in here is a little curious, so I want to unpack it for a minute uh, because uh, you might be reading this and you'll be like, hey, hold on. This is a little confusing because it's saying that I was, if, if I'm bearing no fruit and I'm connected to the vine, the, the gardener cuts me off. And you're like, hey, well, I, hold on. I thought that um, salvation like, was something that was, if I can't earn it, I can't unearn it, right? Like there's just this process of like, man, if I authentically, now, now I challenge you, like really we got to make sure this was an authentic decision that we have to put the weight of our being on Jesus. But if we do, what, if we do that, you might be like, hey, hold on, I thought that, I'm saved, and that's not something that goes away. And I would say you're right. Um, scripture is very clear. Even in, this, in the John 10 chapter, later on, it talks about how not one of these can be plucked from his hand. Like it's something that, that is meant to go on. I want you to think about uh, your kid. What can your child do to stop being your child? Nothing. Right? Like they, they could wrong you. They could steal from you. They could lie to you, which they, they, they will. Newsflash. There's things that they're going to do. They could, they could murder Like, they could do any number of things, and at the end of the day, guess what? They are still your child. Now, fellowship is very different. We're talking relationship. The relationship doesn't change. They're your child. The fellowship, listen, if I don't call my parents for years, our fellowship's not great. I would say we've got broken fellowship. We're not connected at all. Like, there's a disconnect in our fellowship that needs to be addressed. So you might say, hey, Josh, that's, that's well and good, but why then does it use this language of, of cutting off, the, the gardener cutting off that branch? Well, it's really important. We're, we're going to dive into the Greek for a minute, uh, and we're going to talk about that word cut off, which is iro. Uh, and I, I want you to say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three, iro. Great job. Now you guys know Greek. Iro is a word that actually has two definitions in Greek. Uh, and context is going to be a lot like English or really any other language. Context is going to lead you to make a decision on what the definition actually is. Iro can mean to cut off. It also can mean to lift or take up. Okay, we even talked about the word Iro. We, we didn't say it by Greek name, but it was in our, 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 our message last week, right, where Jesus said, I row your mat and go home, right? He said, take up your mat and go home. It's that same word, and it's used both ways in the New Testament. So we see it used as cut off, and we see it as lift up. And you're like, hey, Josh, this is really heady. That's all right. We're going to get through this. And so right now, we have this example of that word, I row, coming into play. And so we got to ask ourselves, hey, which definition are we supposed to be operating with? You might respond, Josh, I thought God's word is inerrant, and it is. Like, we are a church that deeply believes that in the original manuscripts, God's word is completely inerrant. Here's the catch. Translations are hard. Right? If you know multiple languages, you know that translating words over and phrases over is incredibly difficult. Idioms are near impossible. There are just things that are, are challenging with translation differences. So, one, one thing you could do is just learn Greek. Or... Uh, We're really going to have to have not a critical spirit, but read critically the word and try to understand, like, what is it actually saying here? I would actually encourage most people to, one of the best ways to unpack what words mean is just to read multiple translations of the same verse. It's going to help you understand context. And so here's what I'm saying. 
Iroh has two definitions, uh, and we have to figure out which definition it's talking about. And so if we, uh, there was actually a pastor who was wrestling through the same thing because he was like, hey, this doesn't line up uh, with what should be said here. Uh, so I wonder if it means something else. So what he did, he went to Israel uh, because that's like the classic response, right? He goes to Israel and he goes to a vineyard and he asks the guy, he points at a branch that's on the ground. And he says, hey, like that branch is not bearing any fruit. At what point are you going to cut it off? And the guy kind of like looked at him like he was dumb. <laughs> like he was just like, what, what, do you, what do you mean cut it off? But here's what I'm going to do. And what he does is they would take a stick and put it under. They'd lift it up so that it was off the ground and able to bear the fruit that it needs. So what it's saying here is like, this is not so much a threat as a promise and a commitment from our Father. If we are authentically connected to the vine, if we've got a relationship with Jesus, what he's saying is, hey, sometimes you're going to live so much in the dirt of this world, sometimes we're going to get so swept away about, by the stuff that's happening down here. He's saying, hey, I'm going to lift you up that you can bear the fruit that you were meant to bear. And there's another promise in this for those of us that are connected, those of us that are bearing fruit. And this is the one we don't like, right? Like he says, hey, hey, and if you are bearing fruit, guess what? I'm going to prune you. He says, my father will prune you. And that, that process of pruning, if you're not aggregate, agriculturally, I don't know what word I was going for, agriculturally savvy. You might not know what pruning is. Pruning is the process of a healthy plant where you cut away pieces that it can become even more healthy. It says here, it says, I'm going to prune you that you can bear more fruit. You can be more fruitful. And I think that's really important because God's not done with us yet. You know what I mean? Like, like we're invited into this process of being transformed into his, his image. And as I walk beside Jesus... Let me tell you, I am constantly getting convicted by him. Like as I'm walking near him, I'm constantly seeing parts of my life that are just not him. And my man, like God, like I'm missing it over here and I need you to transform this and I need, you to, I need to give this over to you. But if I'm not walking with him, I'm probably not being convicted. In fact, I, I, I quench the Holy Spirit. I, 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 I stop listening. I find ways to listen to other voices. And I turn up the noise in my life that the volume of his voice is turned down or at least there's big obstacles in the way. Guys, we need to figure out what does it look like for us to clear away the noise that we can hear the most important voice. See, this pruning process is this process of constantly being molded and shaped. And then he says, hey, this doesn't look like me. And so he starts cutting things away. And we're like, ah, that hurt, but I look more like you, so that's okay. But you think about it. Like, at what point does an athlete stop practicing? When they stop being an athlete, right? Like, until they are done, like, they're like, hey, like, I need to train. I need to get better. I need to practice. I need to refine my skills. And in the same way, I'm not talking about skills or t uh, checking a box for Jesus. What I'm talking about is spending time with him in such a way that he's going to cut things away in this life. And the whole thing uh, about being a disciple is you don't get to retire. Like, there's no, there's no finish line in this life. In fact, we're, we're working towards an image that in this life we're not going to reach. And at the same time, the more I look like him, the more fulfilled I am, the more purpose I am, and the more driven I am to live out the gospel in my life. And the impact is tremendous. See, we need to get to the fridge, y'all. This is a conversation about how, like, if we are not embracing what he has called us to and building a relationship with, and yeah, he, he's going to prune us. Yeah, there's going to be challenges. Yeah, it's going to be tough. And sometimes he's going to lift us up out of the dirt. But if we're not going to the fridge and getting the food that we need, we're not able to have the impact that we were meant to have. Verse 15.3 kind of just clarifies the audience a little bit. 15.3 says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So we know that he is speaking directly to believers in this moment because they've heard his word and been made clean by it. 15.4, he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain on the, the vine. Do you see it? Like if you want to be a disciple that bears fruit, and that fruit looks like getting in the game and having an impact, 
If we want to do that, we can't be spiritually malnourished where we're so frail that as soon as we take a hit, we, we snap in half. Like we're meant to be armored up. We're meant to be trained up and prepared for the battle ahead. And so often we just get so busy that we just don't let it happen. And then church becomes that only meal a week strategy to check the box and keep going. This is a proximity check. How close are you in your walk with Jesus? And this is a question I ask all the time. Like I, I literally, I'll sit down and I'll be like, hey, how are you in Jesus? And here's the answer I almost always get, and I'm going to challenge you not to give it. I get, we're good. And my response is, I don't know what that means. Right, because when you say good, most of the time what we really mean is we mean normal. And I don't know what your normal operating procedure is. Like, I, don't, I don't know what that standard is. Like, I don't know if normal is like, hey, like, listen, I see him on Sundays and that's cool. Or hey, like, I, like every now and then I pray but not really. Or hey, like I, I check the box over here, here, and here. It's like, hey, look, we need to have a relationship with him. And we need to talk about what he is convicting us on, growing us in, changing, molding us. Because there is a process of pruning and refining by fire that you and I, we're invited into. And it's a good thing. He says, remain in me. And I will also remain in you. And it's this process where we're just invited into relationship with the creator of the universe. And so often we just miss it. And we leave it at the wayside and we do something else. Let me show you what he's talking about here. I, uh, I brought a branch. Because you guys don't know what a branch is, right? Like... <laughs> I brought a branch because I thought it was really important. Like, I looked for this branch at 11 p.m. last night in the mud. This was for you. <laughs> he said, hey, listen, like, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He said, listen, you could hold this branch as tight as you wanted, and it's not going to bear any fruit. You could get a group of friends around, then you guys could like squeeze and like, 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 like just say things over it. Like, hey, you're going to be a good branch who bears good fruit, and it's not going to happen. Maybe you could, I mean, I guess you could glue some fruit onto it, but it's not going to be its own fruit. You could plant it in the ground. You could do a dance around it. You could do anything you want. The, the point is that this branch isn't going to bear fruit. Why? Well, one, it's not from a fruit tree. But that's not the point. It's not connected to its source. It's not connected to the vine. It's not connected to what it needs to be connected to in order to have the life and nourishment that it's meant to have. And that is so often us where we just white knuckle it, right? We're like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can with what I've got. I'm going to push through and push through and I'm going to white knuckle and I'm going to grit my teeth and I'm going to do this on my own strength. And listen, I'm saying this as a hypocrite because I do the same thing. Like there's a gravity to this stuff. I was literally working on this message on, on Thursday. And I'm like working on it. And like halfway through the message, I'm just convicted. I was like, man, I didn't spend time with the Lord this morning. I'm like, man, like I'm preaching on this and I'm still messing it up. Well, y'all, I'm not saying that you're going to do it perfectly. In fact, I promise you, you won't. What I am saying is we're meant to be pursuing it. Like I had to hit the brakes and be like, all right, conviction, I'm here, I'm ready, and I stopped. And that's not to toot my own horn. It's just a reality that we need to figure out what does it look like to get to the feet of Jesus. The fridge is full. What does it look like to go to it regularly? Go to it often that we can get the nourishment that we need. And the challenge is that we're just too busy. Can you relate to that? Like, we're just, we're just too busy. We got so much going on. You're like, Josh, like, honestly, you're a pastor. Like, you do this for a living. It's easy for you to say this from a stage. I get it. The truth is we are too busy. Everything you say yes to, you say no to something else. And we need to evaluate. I need to evaluate. You need to, we need to Evaluate, what are the things I'm saying yes to? Or more importantly, maybe, what am I saying no to that I can say yes to the most important things? See, Jesus was incredibly busy. 
Like, if you look through the Gospels, like, it's, it's very, like, people are, like, crowds are following him. They're, they're trying to figure out, like, hey, how can I get a piece of this, this miracle worker? Like, how can I see what he's doing? How can I take part in his mission? They're, like, all over the place. And it says in Scripture, it says, often he would sneak away to solitary spaces. Why? To be alone because he was an introvert? No, it was to get with his dad. God models for us what he wants for us. He says, we need to sneak away. Like, we need to get away with the Lord, and we need to make it consistent that we're getting the meals that we need to get so that we can grow, that we can mature, that we can be changed and transformed. Because if we are going to be the playmakers that he calls us to be, if we're going to be the disciple makers that he created us to be with the mission that he has given us verbatim in Matthew 28, like, if we're going to live it out the way that we were called, we can't do that if we're spiritually starved. The fridge is full. But we got to get to the fridge. And we got to prepare a meal. And we got to step forward with him. See, the truth is, some of us are so busy trying to do for Jesus that we forget we are supposed to be with Jesus. You ever have that happen? I mean, like, I, like, there's just this tendency for me, like, I'm doing all the Jesus-y things, right? Like, I'm, I'm checking all the boxes. And I look down, and I'm like, man, like, there's no, there's no pair of feet next to me. Like, I'm supposed to be walking with him, and I'm over here checking the boxes. He's like, hey, you need to slow down. Hey, like, you need to enjoy my presence. Hey, you were created for this. Listen, this is the heartbreaking part that I just want to share with you. Here's the, here's the trouble is this should excite us. And I don't think it does. And I'm not saying that because I know you guys super well. It's just because, like, contextually in our culture, it's not something we, we look forward to. Even when we get in the Word so often, it's just like, hey, how can I just get these 15 minutes over with so I can go about the rest of my day? We're supposed to get excited about this. Like, your soul was created for this, to be able to sit down at his feet and enjoy him and be enjoyed by him. Can you imagine if I went to my wife Actually, she comes to me and she said, Josh, I don't feel like we've spoken for the last month. She's like, hey, Josh, like, I don't feel like we're dating. I don't feel like we're, we're really doing anything other than being like just ships in the night passing by each other. We're just kind of roommates at this point. And if my response was, well, I would do those things. I would love you well, but I'm just too busy. And yet we busy Jesus right out of our schedules. There's some boundaries I think that we need to set up. There's boundaries that I know that, that we as a family, we have embraced just because this has to be the number one thing. There's certain things like, for instance, our daughter Lilla, who's six, there's all the games and activities for six-year-olds. I, I don't know if like times have changed. Like when I grew up, maybe because there wasn't internet, we just kind of had baseball and that was it. There's everything. I think she could train an elephant if she wanted to. And we had to set a boundary of like, hey, like, listen, we're going to do one thing really well. Like, you can do one thing, and that's it. And for me, it's like, man, that feels unloving. And at the same time, I need to set that boundary to protect not just me, but my family. And I'm not putting this on you. I'm not saying you have to have our boundary. What I am saying is what you say yes to, you're saying no to something else. And we need to keep the main thing the main thing. Time with Jesus is meant to be most important. If you don't have time, then I would challenge you, I would encourage you, let's find some things to take out so that you can have the time you need to be with him. Now, now hear me, I know there are obstacles in your life. I know that children do not make time with Jesus easy. They're incredible, we love them. But sometimes it's hard, I get it. There's gonna be seasons and there's gonna be challenges to this. The point is, are you actively making an effort to get to the fridge? Here's what I know. Every time that I have tried to get to the fridge, if I couldn't make it all the way, Usually Jesus would find a way to me. The point is, am I making it a priority to step forward with God? Or am I just going through the motions, checking the boxes so that I can get through my day? See, the reality, is, when I talk about being too busy, this, this actually kind of transcends a lot of things that we navigate as a church. Uh, because you're like, hey, like, like Josh, something that you need to know is as a church, even just as a body, we're, we're incredibly busy. And sometimes it's not about getting to the feet of Jesus. Sometimes it's just getting things done that need to be done. Well, I'll let you in on a secret. Did you know that this place is normally a high school? 
If you're here for the first time, surprise. <laughs> right, like, it takes a lot of effort and work for a team to come together uh, and to say, hey, you know what, we're going we're gonna to set up and we're going to tear down. There's a lot of sacrifices that kind of go into that that are incredible. And at the same time, here's what I don't want. I don't want us to have this mindset that if we have a building, it's going to solve our busyness problem. Here's what's going to happen. If we are spiritually unhealthy here, you are wherever you go. And so we will be spiritually unhealthy there. So the challenge is not to look at the building as a solution, but maybe a vehicle. Like a building will be good. Listen, I want a building. I'm in on that. The point is, right now we need to look at our feet and say, like, man, am I near him? Am I close enough to hear his voice? While we're on uh, the topic of the building, I want to give some, some just kind of insight. This is like a sidestep from the message, but I want to just use this as an opportunity to provide clarity. In the middle of transitions, uh, clarity can be a little convoluted. And uh, what I want to do is I just am a deep believer in transparency and clarity. Uh, and so I wanted to just share with you uh, kind of where we are in our search for a building. Now, don't get your hopes up. This is an update that there's no update. But, but, I'm so sorry. I'm the worst. But, again, I don't think we all kind of are on the same page, and I just want to make sure that we all are. And so here's where we are with the building campaign. So there was a campaign, multiple campaigns, uh, done before COVID to raise some money for a building. And that was actually really successful and, and brought us to a really good point. COVID happened, uh, and a transition happened here. We had a year of transformation as a church that kind of transformed us in ways that nobody expected, right? Like, I didn't expect to be uh, a kinetic cutter. Is that what you guys call it? There's nutmegger. I like that so much better. I was really struggling. Some guy told me we we're kinetic cutters. I was like, that's awful. Thank you. That was, I was hazed. I love it. <laughs> All right, so I didn't expect to be a nutmegger. You didn't expect me to be a nutmegger, right? Like, there's just a year of transformation. And in that transformation, also in operating out of a deficit uh, through COVID, um, some things happened where some people, if you donated, some people were called uh, to free up some funds to help us kind of survive in that season. Uh, but I want to let you know where we are. So right now, we have $1.5 million uh, for a building. Uh, now, one, or sorry, one million of that is designated, uh, so that is only going to be used for a building. We've got five mil, or sorry, five hundred thousand. Numbers are not my game, y'all. Five hundred thousand that is undesignated, but it is my intention, hope, and prayer for that money to be used. And so I'm just kind of considering that one lump sum. Now I recognize for some of you, you're like one point five. That's incredible. Love that. Love your heart. Some of you uh, might have some questions, and that's great too. Listen, we're not afraid of questions. Jesus wasn't afraid of questions. So here's my challenge, is if you have questions on this topic, go to the right places. Here's what we don't need to do. We don't need to huddle together and just kind of gossip and just like talk, voice our frustrations without ever seeking the source. Here's what I would say. Come to me. You can come to our staff. You can come to any of our elders. Uh, and we would love to just have a dialogue around it with you. We want to answer your questions. Again, my goal is clarity uh, and transparency, and that's really important. As of right now, uh, we're in the middle of a transition, and so I'm not uh, diving into a search for a building currently. And at the same time, if one of you has 200 acres in West Hartford and just wants to give it to us. <laughs> now, I recognize 200 acres doesn't exist in West Hartford, but if it did, uh, would love for you to just come on, bless our church. But here's the point, is we're going to kind of just take it slow to go fast. If God does something uh, and he provides something for us, uh, we're not going to be hesitant, but we are cautiously and prayerfully moving forward, and I just wanted to provide that update. Again, if you've got other questions, that's not even the point of this message. I just kind of tricked you guys into that, uh, but here we are today, like, right, diving into it. And so we've got this, this mindset, though, that the building is going to solve the problem. Let me tell you, church is not a building. And if you look at the Greek word, it's ekklesia, which is uh, this word that just means a people set apart. And so here's what happens on Sundays. Our church comes here, and then our church goes out. Our church comes here, we talk about the plays, we huddle up, and then we go out. And in order for us to be effective, we need to check, like, are we doing what we need to do? Are we lifting weights? Are we getting the spiritual nourishment that we need to grow and mature and to develop as mature disciples of God that are being not just following Jesus, but being changed by Jesus on mission with Jesus, that we can go forward and flip this state and this world upside down for his name? What does it look like? For us to take seriously 
pursuing his voice. Now, I, I, I say this, and I'm just going to, I'm a big believer in uh, telling on myself. If I'm going to lead a church, you guys need to know my, my weaknesses. And one of my, other than numbers, <laughs> I already, already hashed that out. Uh, but one of my weaknesses is I tend to be very self-reliant. And here's what that looks like. It looks like, hey, God, like I can figure this out um, on my own talent, abilities, and strength. And so I'll come to you when it's time. And what I need is I need a body of believers. That's why I'm also in a life group, right? Like I need a body of believers that are pressing together, bearing each other up, moving forward on mission, and keeping each other accountable. When you see, like, hey, Josh, those spiritual muscles, you look a little frail this week. Do you think that maybe you need to just, like, get some time away with the Lord? Like, man, maybe that's exactly what I need to hear. But if we're not walking together, if we're not walking arm in arm, which is really what our message next week is about, what does it look like for us to be a biblical community going out together, to be on the same team, on the same mission, for the same purpose? But we need a body together. I need a body who's like, hey, Josh, you're being a little self-reliant right now. What does it look like for you to go to the fridge? Because I don't know if you heard, but it's full. But here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to just kind of like preach this message on going to the fridge without giving tools. Like honestly, like if we talk about the Bible, uh, there's just this, this reality that it's a little intimidating sometimes. You guys ever, you ever see that? Where like just opening that book is just, man, it's a big book. It's got a lot of things going on, a lot of contextual things that don't even happen right now. And it's, it's scary. But here's what, here's what we tell our daughter. You can do scary things. Like there are things that God calls us to do, uh, and, and sometimes it's going to be scary, and sometimes it looks like just as simple as opening this book. But here's not, not what I'm going to do. I'm not just going to say, hey, here's the fridge, good luck. I'm going to give you a tool uh, that you can use. You don't have to. There's lots of ways to have a quiet time with the Lord. But I uh, just want to give you a resource that you can dive into the Word, even like right after this, this sermon. Like you can do it. I do, I do it in the mornings just because that's my best time. That's when my brain works right. Find the time that's best for you and give it over to him. And so here's what it looks like. It's called Soap Method. It's something that uh, is kind of unpacked uh, in the book Divine Mentor. It's an incredible book. If you're discipling somebody and want a book to go through, uh, Divine Mentor is a great one about just having a personal walk with the Lord. Uh, and, and what it does is it unpacks something called Soap Method. Here's what it is. Soap Method stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer. It's that simple. So here's my challenge to you. Here's what it looks like. I want you in your mornings... To just read one chapter. I'm not going to give you like 700 chapters. I want to make it like reproducible. Read one chapter, highlight, underline, go buck wild with that thing. And then what I want you to do is go back in and see what you highlighted, what stood out. And I want you to pick just one verse. That's the tough part. One verse, and that's going to be the scripture portion. And you're going to journal it down. And some of us were like, hey, I don't want to journal, but, but I challenge you, do you not want to journal because you don't want to spend the time that it takes? It's going to take time to get at the feet of the Lord. And a lot of times we need to make the internal external. Uh, and so journaling is a great way to do that. So you're going to write down the verse that stood out to you. Next is observation. What truth, what, what context, what's going on, who's the audience? Like write down some of the observations that you have of that story. Uh, and then the next one is application. And this is kind of the meat and potatoes of this thing. This is where you're like, hey, how does this verse apply to my life? Like, what is God trying to change, mold, shift? For me today, it was just like in, in my time with the Lord, he was just reminding me. He was like, hey, I just want to remind you of how unworthy you are, which was not like this self-deprivation thing. It was like, hey, I want you to, to know how unworthy you are, not to be a dad, not to be a husband, just to be pursued by my love. And what he did, he was reminding me of the grace that I desperately need, and I needed that message this morning. So for you, what is the application? Write it down. The last one is prayer, and you're going to write down a prayer. I know like sometimes you're like, hey, it's a little weird to write down a prayer. Listen, it's fine. We're going to get through this, but write down the prayer. It's a really, really good way to make it practical. Then you can even title it. You can put a date on it. You can put the scripture that you read. I have a table of contents because I'm a nerd. Like, there's lots of things that you can do. Like, I, there's, it's okay, but what I would challenge you to do is press in. Give it over to him and really intentionally spend your time with him. Here's the point. There's lots of ways to do this. And if you're like, hey, I forgot everything you just said, that's okay. Soap Method is on our website, so you can just go there. But the point is, you and I were designed and meant and created for authentic relationship with Jesus. Like, you and I, we're meant to sit at his feet. Like, that's, like, his presence is what heaven is all about. Like, like getting with him is what we are all about. That's what we're created for. That's what he ushers us into. And when we do that, 
He's going to give us the spiritual muscles and the spiritual nourishment that we need that we can effectively get in the game in the way we were called. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this time together that we could unpack your word and what it means to pursue your word, to get in it uh, maybe alone, maybe together, maybe in a group, uh, but give us the chance to truly sneak away to solitary spaces that we can be with you. Help us to be a people that know your voice well, a people that uh, can identify the counterfeit, a people that are so connected to you that we can't help but bear much fruit. God, you are good. In all of this, we pray this for your glory and for your name. Amen.